University. In fact, I'm a former student of, uh, of Professor Walpers, um, so, which means that I'm not responsible for any factual inaccuracies that I communicate here today. Um, I think that today's conversation is, is quite timely. Um, mass atrocity prevention is gaining a lot of attention, and not only because of the unfortunate uh, situation that's currently ongoing in Syria. Both in Washington and Brussels, atrocity prevention has gained in prominence on the foreign affairs uh, and the foreign policy agenda. In Washington, atrocity prevention and R2P uh, appear in key strategic documents, including the uh, previous national security strategy. Uh, in, in August 2011, the Obama administration issued a presidential study directive creating the Interagency Atrocity Prevention Board, or APB. This is a senior committee that scans the horizon for areas at risk of atrocities and offers actionable recommendations to tackle the sources of potential atrocities early on in the prevention phase. I do want to note that when we talk about these issues in Washington, D.C., they're usually approached through the atrocity prevention or genocide prevention lens. Much less so is the word uh, R2P uh, frequently used in, in, in Washington. That's more applicable in New York uh, at the UN and in many capitals around the world. R2P has become the prime principle through which these, these issues are approached. Now moving on to the other side of the Atlantic, we notice that the peace-building capacity of the European Union uh, mainly resides within the recently created European External Action Service, or EEAS, uh, an EU institution that resembles a mix between an EU diplomatic corps and uh, an uh, EU foreign affairs department, led by Catherine Ashton. Uh, within the EU, the focus is much more on conflict prevention of which R2P is considered a subset of the activity. Um, that being said, European countries are and have expressed uh, broad support for the R2P principle at the uh, UN General Assembly. And the European Parliament recently adopted a recommendation to the Council on R2P. So in theory, this shared commitment between the United States uh, and Europe uh, to prevent mass violence should allow for facilitated uh, cooperation transatlantically in this area. But the coordination levels are surprisingly low, both between governments and civil society organizations uh, working these issues. Of course, this is quite unfortunate since transatlantic cooperation on this issue could, in some cases, uh, enhance the legitimacy of preventive action and offer important cost-sharing benefits. Now, at USIP, uh, preventive action is a, is a core element uh, of our mandate. And one way we try to advance this field is by convening high-level bipartisan commissions or task forces that bring the country's best minds and most experienced practitioners together to grapple with tough policy challenges, such as the way towards atrocity prevention. And together with uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and Brookings Institution, USIP is hosting a working group on the responsibility to protect, which is co-chaired by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and Ambassador Richard Williamson. Uh, this working group seeks to increase understanding of R2P and overcome the political hurdles uh, to advance uh, R2P implementation. The group concluded its formal, formal sessions last year and is now gearing up to roll out its report in July of this year, so stay tuned. At this point, I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Bartoli, uh, who serves as Dean of the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. He's been at the school since 2007, working primarily on peacemaking and genocide prevention. He was also the closing speaker uh, at the Interactive Dialogue on Responsibility to Protect at the uh, UN General Assembly uh, in 2012. Uh, I believe a full bio is available uh, at the entrance uh, of the room. So at this point, Dr. Bartoli, the floor is yours. About uh, these issues. Um, 
I do believe that uh, it's important for us to position the conversation in a slightly long term, to move away from the crisis in Syria to a sense of how we are evolving as a system, as a human system, looking at atrocities prevention. And even just the name atrocity is a very interesting one. It's a relatively recent uh, solution that David Shepherd offered to the limitation of the frame that was created in 1948 by Lemkin when uh, suggested genocide as the way in which the human family could recognize the intentional killings of groups as such. The limitation of that uh, proposition, as we all know, is that uh, it creates uh, boundaries around the grouping, the identity. Why is a group a group? How do you determine a group? Who is determining the group? Why is the group uh, identified in such a way? Uh, religious, ethnic uh, identities are considered, racial identities are considered legally relevant, but not political ones. And this is why Barbara Harfurst and many others have started grappling with the problem of definition. Uh, David's solution of atrocities is uh, a way to capture a world of attempt to name what humans do to humans in extreme conditions. Uh, crime against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, that are the three crimes together with genocide listed in the Rome Statute that do pertain at to P um, are in themselves a very interesting history of how the humans have tried to grapple with definitions of conditions that are difficult for us to understand when we are seated at USIP looking outside. It's a nice, fairly not sunny but nice day, and uh, we are in. Um, safe environment, not just because somebody checked us out and we don't have any weapons and we are not loaded and we are in DC, not in Virginia. And, uh, <laughs> and we have a relatively safe environment. But because we have spent time to think, to talk, to engage, If somebody comes with a plan to kill you because you are a Tutsi, you do not have that time. You do not have that leisure. You do not have that space. And if you ended up in a place where you do not want to be, you do not have that time. You do not have that space. You do not have that leisure. And if you end up in a place like in a church where you are expecting to be saved, and that church, exactly because it is supposed to be a safe haven, actually becomes a place where you are attacked. Has it happened many times when people call a safe haven a haven that they cannot defend? Then people are killed exactly in the place where they are looking for the safety that they cannot find for themselves. Then in those situations, something really terribly wrong is happening because the people involved in those conditions are deprived of the capacity of moving. Moving with their head, moving with their bodies, moving relationally in situations in which they could be saved. A student of mine was sharing with me the story of September 11, and the call she received from her father, really angry, because when September 11 happened, she didn't go home to take the passport. The father was saying, it happened to us before. When things happen, you have your passport with you. You need to be ready to move immediately. The reason I'm mentioning this is because we frequently fail to recognize that movement is not just a question of the body is the question of how we regulate ourselves. It becomes clear when we go to an airport. Nobody could move these days if you do not have a passport, if you do not go through a metal detector, if you do not have a ticket. If you happen to be somebody who is undocumented, that doesn't have the money, that doesn't have a recognition, you do not move easily. And genocide, mass atrocities happen in closed systems, in systems that have been closed by forces 
that prevent outsiders to relate, open, witness what is happening. So why do I salute the American interest in atrocities prevention? I salute that because it is the sign that we are finally getting into a collective understanding that atrocities are not made by someone else. They are made by humans to humans. They are not made out in a vacuum. They are made into a legal system that now comprises the whole globe. And they are made in a time, in a space, that we can actually connect with extremely well, extremely precisely. So the responsibility of knowing what is happening or knowing what could happen, knowing what is uh, on the verge of occurring and doing nothing is a responsibility that we need to take. So the US government started collecting data um, in a way, I would say, more concerned around political instability. This was the name of the task force, actually, that started the process and started becoming interested in responses, in interventions after Rwanda. So you have two parallel processes. You have a post-communist post instability process that leads the Americans to think, what is stability? How stability comes about? How is instability? Why should we concern ourselves with instability? And then to say, well, instability very often creates conditions for mass atrocities, for genocide and problems, so let's look into that. But I think it's important to realize that there is no humanitarian intent at the beginning. Americans are concerned with global stability. Stability is an important idea. It's an important element of what constitutes freedom, or what constitutes the conditions for prosperity. And I think it's important to see this decoupling of violent, warlike interventions and the idea of stability in itself. But what is interesting is that conceptually, this process occurs while Americans are starting to grapple intellectually, scientifically, the notion of chaos, the notion of complexity. And you realize that actually one of the most instable conditions is an overly controlled environment, an overly closed environment, where you attempt to constrain the chaotic generative dimension of the human interactivity into something that cannot be whole. And so you realize that actually something that is extremely oppressive may have the appearance of being very stable, may have the appearance of being very controlled, but is actually not at all stable and not at all controlled and uh, actually comes very often at the cost of millions of, peop of, of people's lives lost. We saw that in Stalin repressive regime, we saw that in, in Mao regime, we, we saw that and we see this today uh, in, in, uh, um, in very serious abusive regimes. So Americans start playing with the idea that actually stability comes from movement. Stability comes from adaptability. Stability comes from openness. Stability comes from allowing people to move in and out. Stability comes from idea of moving in and out. Stability comes from exchanges. And this is an, extraordinarily it's, it's an extraordinary bet. That means to trust the people. What a novel idea. Trust the people. Trust the people that they can govern themselves. Trust the people that they can find the institution that can govern themselves. Trust the people that they can find a way to go if and when they need to go. Well, it's an interesting American project, but it's also destabilizing in many situations, and many people are not exactly happy with this uh, implicit recognition that communities could and should be free to decide for themselves where to go. So what do we have now? We have a president that says, um, I'm quoting, Preventing mass atrocities and genocide is a core national security interest and a core moral responsibility of the United States of America. Well, this is a leap. It's a very interesting leap. 
Uh, first of all, it would be interesting to have, and we have many distinguished guests today, so we'll have in the question and answer period some time to debate this, but it's very interesting to uh, define the idea of the core. Why is it that preventing mass atrocities and genocide is a core national security interest? Why is that? Why is it in the American interest to prevent the killing of enemies in mass? Why should that be in itself a core interest and a moral argument, as the president says, a moral responsibility? Well, one uh, hypothesis is that uh, if you take a system approach, you actually have significant reduction of options when element in the systems are eliminated. That is to say, simply, if uh, you take me out, you are deprived of my words. You may say, well, that's very good. It's, you know, we, we don't need those anymore. Uh, you are deprived of my dreams or my capacity to generate solutions. You may actually end up not knowing what you could have known if I were with you. And this is multiplied by the number of people that are eliminated. But it's also even more when you speak about groups. Humans are depriving themselves of hundreds of thousands of words every day. We speak of biodiversity, but we rarely speak about anthropodiversity. We created hundreds of thousands of languages in small groups speaking to one another and calling each other and giving us names. And we are losing that because everybody speaks English. Everybody is homogenized. We know from a system perspective that that's an extraordinary danger. That we cannot deprive ourselves of that diversity and actually we should, <clears throat> as much as possible, preserve that diversity and open ourselves to the diversity that is coming, to the diversity that is emerging, to the diversity that comes when we do interact freely with one another. Well, if we take a system approach, any eliminations, especially eliminations that do have the capacity to linger in the system as memory, are extraordinarily dangerous and should be taken with great care. I think it's important for us to realize that whatever position we take about killing massively human people, there is an interest of us as human family in preserving the space for diversity and the system generativity that comes with it. The negative side of diversity, as anybody who works in the US government knows very well, is that uh, diversity is difficult to coordinate. And the more you have proliferation, the more difficult it is to bring coherence. And this is the other new things that uh, the directive that the president uh, issued and is bringing to bear on something as complicated as preventing mass atrocities. That is the coordination of so many bodies. So okay, so we say we want to do X, we want to prevent atrocities. What are you exactly doing to do that? What is really happening? Well, we know that, uh, the, um, that uh, the directive um, required the comprehensive interagency review of the U.S. government capabilities and that the Atrocities Prevention Board was established. Now, um, the Atrocities Prevention Board includes senior representative of the Department of State, Defense, Treasury, Justice, Homeland Security, Joint Staff, USAID, US Mission to the United Nations, Office of Director of National Intelligence, the, Cent the CIA, the Office of the Vice President and National Security Staff. Anybody having any experience of coordinating these bodies within, not among, not, but within, realize that it's just mind boggling. It's a phenomenal task. It's, 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 it's an incredible feast that opens itself to the ludicrous cynicism of saying, well, this is never going to happen. It will never happen. This is just a waste of time. Why are you even trying? 
For once, I would like to say, I really salute the US government for trying. Because I do believe that unless we try, we will never learn. Coordination is indeed a serious challenge. It's very clear that it's very difficult to bring coherence in something as big and diverse and complicated as the US government. But if we do not try here, how could we possibly try when atrocities happen? How could we possibly expect to be able to do it when the crisis is there? If we do not take the time, as the APB is doing every month, regularly, to try to come to an understanding, coming fr from these different facets, of something <clears throat> as precise as Kenya, as precise as um, Central African Republic, how can we possibly imagine that this coherence will emerge miraculously at the moment <coughs> of the crisis? We need to give ourselves the time the space to engage in such a way that the coordination may emerge. Is this a given? Absolutely not. But the very fact that the um, APB exists, I think it's an important signal. How did the APB come to, come, came to, mind, came to exist? I see at least three major <coughs> forces. You have a, an internal political force within the Obama administration, Samantha Power and the others that were pushing for something like this. You have experts coming together, USAIP, the Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Task Force on Genocide Prevention, that I, <coughs> I can see Todd here, and that suggested something, that said, well, this is something that could be done. And then you have a push from NGOs saying, this is among the many recommendations, something that is very reasonable. This is something that should happen. So you have this convergence of very three important streams that bring together the APP. Well, these streams can go in all directions very easily. You have a change in the political uh, um, milieu. You have a, a, a different opinion from the expert. You have the NGOs moving away. But I think it would be a waste not to try to make the APB work, not to try to make this effort of the US government coordination work, and make it institutional, not dependent on personalities, not dependent on who is going to be in an office one day or not. Why? <clears throat> Again, I do believe that genocide, mass atrocities occur in closed, unadaptive systems. And that we are part of those systems. We are opening them when we gather proper data. We are opening them when we apply our analytical capacity to understand them properly. We open them the same way you would open a system of a car accident. You do not necessarily go to those who have the accident to understand what happened. You have an external actor's understanding the dynamics of, of that, accident, uh, that accident and explaining that to the parties themselves. So there is a responsibility of being in Washington. There is a responsibility of being seated at a computer getting information without being attacked, without being under pressure of being killed tomorrow or in half an hour. There is a responsibility of the space that you can generate through the knowledge that you have access to. And I think that is in this space that the APB and the American leadership <coughs> take place. It's a leadership at the service of an understanding that, in, that um, um, capture all of us. The responsibility not to intentionally kill human groups as such, not intentionally kill massive numbers of human beings. I think it is indeed a core responsibility. But it's not just a core responsibility of the US government as a bureaucratic machine. It's a core responsibility of the US government as made of citizen concerns with political formations that have indeed the duty to be open to its citizens. So I do believe <coughs> that what we see happening around atrocities prevention is very telling and goes to the core of what a state is all about. More people were killed by states in the last century than by wars. States were supposed to protect citizens, they were not. We need to make sure that states in the 21st centuries are states that do understand their relationship with citizens. 
their relationship with their society. And they do understand that American leadership is about a freedom of movement that is not just about ideas and voting, but also movement of people, movement of goods, movement of opportunities. I do believe that the counterbalance of this movement is the responsibility of making sure that when people happen to be in danger, happen to be in conditions of difficulties, somebody may intervene. Now, interventions are a construct that we definitely need to deconstruct. There is something that is in front of us even more daunting than coordinating U.S. government agencies and bodies, which is the coordination of local, national, regional, international levels. How do you put together a small community in Burundi with the knowledge that is available in Washington? How do you put together New York with what's happening in a small Rohingya's village uh, where the, the clashes are happening? And I think that that problem is what is going to see emerging in the future. And this is where I think that the transatlantic cooperation or the possibility of Europeans and Americans to work together and the possibility of exploring ways in which uh, institutional formation like the APB, like this long-term data gathering that have been started, may open up the possibility for small communities, national um, states, regional organizations to come together in an interactive system. The Europeans are moving in that direction. The Americans certainly took the lead in this area. I do believe that uh, many may criticize whatever is happening and the feasibility of what is uh, presented, but I tend to be an optimist, I'm an optimist. I, I tend to believe that the urgency to think ahead learning from what has been done is an urgency that has indeed a core value for all of us. So thank you for the moment. Thank you, Dr. Bartoli, for that uh, insightful presentation. I think you did an excellent job at dissecting the justification of the recent U.S. government activities uh, initiatives, including the creation of the atrocities prevention boards. I think in, in addition to Maintaining the political momentum, uh, I also see a challenge in uh, uh, figuring out ways and how we can realize this this political prioritization uh, and, and, and translate the political priority into doctrine, institutions, and, and, and ground activities. So uh, I'm certain, certainly we'll address that in, in the Q&A section. Uh, at this point, please join me in welcoming the second speaker uh, of today, uh, Dr. Jan Wouters, is Professor of International Law and International Organizations and Director of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies at the University of Leuven. Professor Wouters. Thank you. First of all, it's a great honor to be here. It's my very first visit to the <coughs> Institute of Peace, and I'm uh, really very much uh, impressed uh, by not just the audience, uh, but also the, the very surroundings. As being a lawyer, I'll start with a disclaimer, if I may. And my first disclaimer is that um, I'm uh, less an optimist than the previous speaker. I'm uh, a bit pessimistic, although sometimes in Europe we define pessimism by being an optimist with some sense of realism. In any event, uh, the time is not very good in Europe, as you can imagine. Um, and there is some, I think, reason to be concerned about a number of, uh, say, developments in the European integration process. I'll, I'll explain a bit further um, down my story. The second disclaimer is that as uh, an academic, I'm just that. I'm just an academic, and you know what do academics do. Uh, there is a famous saying that those who can, they do. Those who can't, they teach. And we used to add to it, if you really do not know anything about the problem, you write a book about it. So that's what we academics are doing. And that's what I'm going to share with you a bit of my own scholarship with regard to um, R2P and the role of the European Union in that respect. We have a, a, a few publications about it. There is a, a working paper. I have a few copies of that, but I'm sure that links uh, are going to be provided uh, and so on. Now let me, let me situate the topic a little bit uh, in, in a broader context. What is the European Union? 
the European Union has embarked as an economic partnership, but always with a political ambition of staving off war and conflict among its members. Uh, there is very interesting symbolical language about this kind of you know, underlying structural conflict prevention goal of the European uh, integration process already at the time that we were only just you know, making markets more integrated. If you look back to the so-called Paris Treaty of 1951, the European Coal and Steel Community, the very first European community, in the preamble you find indeed language referring to this, I would say, a Schumann uh, declaration, the approach of making sure that through, if you wish, pooling resources, in this case steel and coal, <laughs> and the idea that you, you, you create solidarities of fact, that you are going to, in a certain way, um, uh, create, uh, make war de facto impossible between uh, the enemies of the past and contribute to, to world peace. That, was, that idea was already there when we only had the ambition of, if you wish, creating a common market in coal and steel. You can imagine that the idea has only uh, become more bold when we went to a full common market with the Rome Treaty, when we went with the Maastricht Treaty to a full uh, political union, economic and monetary union, and of course uh, along the steps towards what we now have our current institutional framework where we have the Lisbon Treaty in place and we have a European Union that has strong ambitions internally but also uh, externally. And let me say something about this because we felt a little bit emboldened back in 2012 when the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the organization. I'm not sure it had the best possible formulation to justify the award of the Nobel Peace Prize, but it gave us this kind of boost in difficult times to say, okay, maybe it was worth to start up this process. But if you look at the language of our current treaty, it is extremely bold in terms of our ambitions um, to, if you wish, be a force for the good in the world. What does it say? I, mean, I quote from it. It says, the European Union in its external relations with the, f with the rest of the world shall be guided by the principles which have inspired its own creation development and enlargement, and which it seeks to advance in the wider world. Democracy, rule of law, the universality and indivisibility of human rights, respect for human dignity, principles of equality and solidarity, the respect for the principles of the United Nations Charter and international law. And respect for international law principles, of course, also encompasses the emerging responsibility to protect. So, I mean, you would say, that we have taken at least this kind of declaration, constitutional uh, commitment to contribute to world peace, to respect and further develop international law, and try to work as much as possible with the United Nations. It's a fairly remarkable, explicit commitment in the EU's constitution to working towards global, uh, say, uh, multilateral solutions, multilateral solutions to global problems, in particular, in uh, relation with the United Nations. So that's a quite a remarkable statement. Now, let me come to the United Nations for a moment uh, to, to try to problematize a little bit our subject matter. Because my basic point here in the very first place when we look at R2P is that there is actually a, a, fun, a rather fundamental, if you wish, disconnect or mismatch in the relationship between the United Nations and the European Union as a regional organization. Let me explain uh, myself. Well, first of all, you know, uh, R2P has been uh, officially um, pronounced in this outcome um, document of the World Summit in September 2005 in New York. You have these beautiful paragraphs of that outcome document. What is very interesting there is that, um, say, the notion of responsibility to protect was proclaimed there, I would say in a rather uh, narrow uh, meaning, much more narrow than the notion that was actually conceived in, uh, say, the earlier report of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which uh, uh, so foresaw a much broader and more important role for regional organizations in case the Security Council would not be able to discharge um, its, its functions. But uh, that responsibility to protect notion was laid down with a very strong primacy on the role of the United Nations itself. It does mention a possible role for regional organizations, but this is all to be seen in the very classical setup of the United Nations. What does it mean? Primacy of the Security Council. It means a possible role for regional organizations, 
but all structurally limited, I would say, by the framework of especially Chapter 8, Regional Arrangements of the United Nations Charter. And that basically means that there is fundamental primacy of the United Nations, of the United Nations uh, Security Council, and that, in other words, uh, the role of regional organizations, especially when it comes um, to taking operational action in cases of crisis management, needs to be clearly, uh, say, conditioned and subjected to the primacy of the Security Council. So, I mean, uh, in a certain way, the, e the UN has a difficulty in coping with regional organizations, and I, I wish I could say this has now improved. There have been, uh, say, years in which Kofi Annan had regular summits between the UN and all kinds of regional organizations. It became a bit less with the current Secretary General, but the fundamental problem is still there, and the UN has not been able to cope with it uh, properly. Um, let me give you a couple of, uh, say, um, further uh, developments on this. The notion of R2P was indeed endorsed in 2005. There was general agreement that there were lots of still ambiguities and that these things had to be further, if you wish, conceptually clarified, especially also with regard to the possible role of regional uh, organizations. Now, uh, how has this been done? The United Nations uh, has uh, typically uh, created a couple of uh, actors, uh, special advisors to the Secretary General on uh, prevention of genocide on R2P, have uh, elaborated a number of uh, reports in between basically 2009 and 2012. What is interesting there is that in these reports you see the struggling with how to give a proper role to regional organizations. And actually when you consider the whole thing uh, as a whole, I think they have not yet been able to define such a proper role. Let me give you a couple of hints from what is in that thinking process. Um, in 2009 already, there was uh, a report of the Secretary General saying, yes, regional organizations can play an important role, especially at the kind of preventative level of which we speak here today, because, the, um, it said, those regional organizations can offer technical assistance in state-to-state -state learning processes in order to if you wish, further the protection responsibilities of states vis-a-vis -vis their own uh, population. And there was the experience of the European Union literally referred to in that 2009 report, because as you know, the European Union is one of those organizations that has set rather high thresholds for admission to the club, of membership of the club. And um, that is what in EU language we call the Copenhagen criteria, it means not just swallowing the hundred thousands of pages of the so-called ACQUI, the so-called EU legislation that is in place, but also respecting really uh, democracy, rule of law, human rights, having stable political, independent judicial institutions, and so on and so forth. And the Secretary General in his 2009 report basically said, you know, this kind of things can be useful. They can be useful as setting an example uh, region to region, um, they can be a form of, if you wish, technical um, uh, assistance. A second function, apart from this uh, learning uh, function, uh, could be the role of regional organizations as vehicles for dispute settlement, peaceful settlement of disputes. And there, of course, there are plenty of um, uh, illustrations, not just the European Union. You have those things within the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation, in Europe, you have these mechanisms in ECOWAS, uh, the Economic Community of West African States. You have uh, uh, the African Union with its capacity building programs and so on and so forth. So that, I think, is, is fairly uh, obvious. There is a third facilitating role that has been um, um, uh, distinguished and has been identified by the United Nations, namely that they can, that regional organizations can play a kind of political and operational bridging role, um, say, between the global standards and uh, national action. And I think that, that that is fairly obvious as well. Uh, regional organizations do, of course, have the great advantage that they are closer, geographically speaking, but not just geographically, also culturally, in terms of understanding, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, better knowing a little bit the sensitivities of a particular local uh, conflict or, or tension. So regional organizations, because of that uh, proximity in the widest sense of the word, uh, 
can act as uh, bridge builders, can contribute to a deeper, if you wish, understanding um, and, and mediation, if you wish, um, to look at the local situation. It's sometimes referred to as regional organizations, as so-called middle-level mediators for reconciling, uh, say, um, uh, positions, bringing it closer to the national level, where, of course, at the purely national level, there is the idea that there should be strong ownership of the idea of responsibility to protect by the local authorities, but where very often you need structural uh, support to individual states. And there, of course, regional, sub-regional arrangements can play a rather important role, building capacity, acting as bridge builders between the global and uh, the local. Now, this being said, in a European Union context, you should not be naive. The EU has its past. I mean, by that I mean the European Union's member states have their past. Uh, for many countries, places in the world, there is still a very looming, if you wish, colonial past. So one should be very careful treating uh, and, and saying, you know, the EU can play a role here or there in that region. Uh, remember also the Arab Spring, the Libya intervention, and so on. There are certain issues there where one has to treat very carefully and where really has, one has to be aware that the EU is not just the EU. The EU is also, if you wish, the collective legacy, and in the good, but also in the less good sense, of uh, the past of its uh, member states. So, I mean, that's, that's also the question of the, the bridge building with regard to uh, regional organization. Last but not least, the idea is that regional organizations can play a role with regard to structural prevention and capacity building. Now, that sounds very nice, but how do you do that? Um, and, in fact, that is where we are currently in the United Nations reflection. The latest report of 2012 is saying, well, there is a very interesting potential there for that uh, so-called second pillar role of regional organizations. But we don't know how to cope with this. It's in need of further, um, if you wish, refinement, conceptual refinement, improvement. And actually, the main problem remains that the United Nations and its setup, the charter, leaves very little scope there for local, I mean, uh, regional, sub-regional uh, autonomy. There is the fear that these things have to be controlled, that there should always be the primacy of the United Nations structure in particular, the Security Council. So we are actually, we are, we are not yet at the stage where you can say that the precise division of roles between the United Nations, the global level, and regional, sub-regional organizations has been properly defined. I would just hope that more effort can be done in this respect, but it requires some serious rethinking of some of the basic foundations of the United Nations Charter, in particular uh, Chapter uh, 8. That brings me to the second part of my, my story. Where does the European Union uh, s uh, stand in this whole uh, debate? Now, there's, there's a good substantive um, uh, explanation to be given about you know, the EU's attitude to R2P and so on. But before I come to that substantive thing, let me, if you wish, point to a number of uh, difficulties from an institutional uh, point of view. The EU has a problem. The EU has a fundamental problem even in this respect. First of all, the EU is not the EU. Uh, by that, I mean the following. Um, very often in, scholar, in scholarly debate, it's all about EU assuming responsibility. You have to be aware that here you speak about 27, soon 28 member states that still have a very strong sense of autonomy, sovereignty, especially in the external sphere. It suffices when you go to the United Nations in New York to see what the actual place of the EU in the concert of nations is. Go to the General Assembly Hall, you look at it, you see the states sitting there like you are sitting here, and in the fringes on the blue seats, you will see the observers. And where is the EU sitting? In between the African Union and the Organization for Islamic Cooperation. So among the observer seats, I'm not, I don't want to generalize this picture too much because it doesn't give a proper view of the position and the role of the EU in world affairs, but it tells you something about the mindset, not just of many third countries, uh, from, say, non-EU member states in the United Nations, but even from our own 27 member states who continue to keep their central seat in the uh, UN, in the General Assembly, of course, even more so in the Security Council, can you imagine, permanent seats and so on. So, I mean, there is a problem which we have not yet been able to surmount and which we have to be 
really aware of. There is still a very strong sense of sovereignty, especially for states in their international relations. That uh, is something which definitely makes the EU a more uh, complicated actor in international uh, affairs. There's another issue which I, I want to highlight here. The EU has a problem, not just because of this you know, relationship with its own member states, but also because of its institutional complexity. Um, we, we all hoped that you know treaty changes, simplifications that were um, that were uh, basically um, introduced by the Lisbon Treaty on the 1st of December 2009, that it would make the EU a stronger international actor. Now, th more than three years down the road, the question is, where do we stand here? And of course, the external context is not very dis uh, conducive. You have the rapid emergence of uh, um, emerging economies and so on. You have the crisis, the financial crisis, uh, but also the Eurozone, sovereign debt crisis, which has, of course, uh, tainted the image of the EU and European countries in the world. But the very first problematic lies in the institutional complexity of the European Union itself. Jonas already mentioned that the capacity of the EU with regard to peace building is uh, vested in a relatively new institutional actor, the European External Action Service which is indeed the European diplomatic service created by the Lisbon Treaty in order to support the also newly created high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. That's the official title of Catherine Ashton. The high rep created by the Lisbon Treaty to respond basically to what is attributed to uh, Kissinger, the question when I have to dial Europe, which phone number do I choose? Well, in fact, that's a good idea. Now we have the phone number of Lady Ashton. I don't have it personally, but okay. You can reach her. The problem is that the Lisbon Treaty has not just created the High Rep and Lady Ashton. It has left all the other old actors in place, the Commission, the Member States, even the presidency of the Council, this rotating thing where every six months it's another country uh, exercising the presidency function. The idea was that in the external affairs, there would now be a single person, Ashton, or at the highest political level, the permanent president of the European Council, uh, Herman van Rompuy. But the reality is that member states, also when they exercise the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union, still need and want to have their place in, under the sun in international affairs. And you see that in quite a number of international organizations, not just in the multilateral scenery, but also in the bilateral settings. Here in Washington, we are in a unique uh, environment in that respect, because this is a place where you have a strong, very big European Union delegation, but at the same time, each of the 27 member states has also a very strong bilateral diplomatic representation and full embassies here. So that creates a very interesting kind of dynamics that show you indeed how difficult it is for the EU to play this reading, leading role in uh, say, international uh, relations. The institutional complexity is quite, um, has in a way only been, um, if you wish, uh, further uh, exacerbated by the Lisbon Treaty, uh, especially when you look at some of the instruments that are of importance for the prevention of mass atrocities. I'm not going to give you a mini crash course in EU institutional setup, but you have to be aware that some of the main instruments which the European Union disposes of with regard to pre uh, prevention of atrocities does not lie within the European External Action Service. Yes, you do have one person there uh, dealing with the problematic, one person, eh? um, but you, you have, of course, most of the instruments at which the EU is good are still safely in the hands of the European Commission, which is a distinct institution. It has its development aid budgets, one of the biggest in the world. It has humanitarian aid budgets, also one of the largest in the world. It has, of course, its very strong trade instruments. And you could say, what does trade have to do with the prevention of mass atrocities? Well, I really think that the trade instruments could have, if you use them very cleverly and consistently, could have a rather important structural role with regard to you know, bringing countries um, in accordance not just with human rights obligations, but also you know, with regard to certain elementary aspects of 
of behavior vis-a-vis -vis their own citizens. You can have a lot of conditionality there if you play it uh, cleverly, and there are some instruments in place, such as what we call GSP plus and so on, things that are conditioning market access um, uh, for, for imports of products from third countries to, say, good, I would say, behavior uh, with regard to human rights, the rule of law, and so on. But you have to use it cleverly, but you have to be aware those policy instruments are not within the external action service. They are in the European Commission, and so the very first institutional challenge in Brussels is to make the various institutional actors, Commission, external action service, Council, member states, and so on, work efficiently together. You can imagine what a daunting task this is, and so the life in Brussels is very often Descript, described as something of a daily turf battle, uh, turf battles between all those agencies. And um, I'm not saying that the life of the EU delegations in places like Washington is like that. That's a big difference. They are much more pragmatic. They are dealing with their member states. They are coordinating. They are interacting with the US government. So you see a lot of very interesting and I think positive dynamics of the EU in countries with the local EU delegation interacting with all the actors on the ground. But in Brussels, there is almost on a daily basis this kind of, you know, imbroglio, this kind of turf battles uh, going on. And it leads to a further, if you wish, lack of political leadership. There is, in general, a strong political leadership deficit in Europe right now. And you really can have a long reflection about how does it come, does it have to do with the new generation of national politicians that is not like the days of Mitterrand, Kohl, and what have you? Or does it have to do partly because that the institutional setup is so complex and that with the diversity among 27, soon 28 member states spanning really very diverse traditions and backgrounds, that it becomes increasingly difficult to act homogeneously uh, internally but also externally. There are lots of issues here which we have to overcome. Yeah, it was one of the sayings of the French president Mitterrand, il faut laisser le temps au temps. You have to give them some time. It's a very recent project. Let's not, forgot, let's not forget that we are not just, uh, we're just more than 50 years old, not, 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 not much older, and that in that time span we have already gone a very long way if you compare with, say, the previous parts of the 20th century and the centuries uh, before. But there is a problem of political leadership and there is an additional problem that we have had the boldness of writing down in the Lisbon Treaty these extremely high aspirations of being a normative actor, a force for the good in the world out there that we are going to push for consistently all over the board for human rights, for rule of law, for, um, say, democracy, and so on and so forth. This, if anything, has only increased what uh, academics have been referring to already for ages as the so-called expectations delivery gap. Uh, it's a notion used by Professor Chris Hill from Cambridge. It's expectations gap, I mean, there are a lot, enormous expectations, which we have only made larger by putting these normative claims in the Lisbon Treaty, by forcing EU institutions to consistently go for all of these, um, say, policies and values in their external relations whereas the actual delivery potential, especially in times of budgetary uh, cutbacks, is extremely, uh, say, um, challenging. So that just in terms of the institutional um, uh, picture where I want to uh, basically give you also a bit of a sobering message. There are very good things happening, but it's extremely slow, it's cumbersome, and uh, there are really institutional setup problems uh, back in Brussels. Where does the EU stand with regard to the subject matter of the whole problematic? Well, it has always been very positive vis-a-vis -vis, uh, responsibility to protect. There are countless statements made on behalf of the whole EU and its member states in the United Nations context, in every possible policy document from development aid to CFSP, the so-called uh, European Security Strategy, adopted in 2003, with a new report updated a bit in 2008 during the French presidency and where under the insistence of the French and the French foreign minister who was Bernard Kouchner, and as you can know, Kouchner was of course, uh, if you wish, the, the moral father of the uh, whole idea of le droit and even le devoir d'ingérence. So the idea of responsibility to protect was very dear to his heart. They tried to write it down explicitly 
in the 2008 report on the European security strategy, and they managed to. But what is important is not so much that you find an endorsement of R2P in that report. What is more important is to know that it took a, an enormous effort to do so. And this shows something else. Member states are not all on the same wavelength with regard to R2P. There are important differences there. Let me just give you one example which shows this very concretely. Remember when the Security Council in March 2011 adopted Resolution 1973, the second Chapter 7 Resolution on Libya, remember? After 1970, which referred the case to the ICC and so on. 1973 was about really giving the mandate, remember, the UN speak, to use all necessary measures, in this case, all necessary measures to protect civilians. Well, very interesting, it was a UN Security Council, which, you know, one of the first times in history, the Security Council operationalized the principle of R2P. Well, the voting record here was that you had a number of countries abstaining. No vetoes, fortunately, but a number of countries abstaining. These were the BRICS countries on board of the Security Council, very interestingly as a phenomenon, but also Germany. Germany abstained in this uh, resolution. And that, of course, led to kind of a little political storm in Europe, because how could it be that on this very important point of finally you know, exercising your responsibility to protect, that a country, that an EU member state like Germany would abstain you can have a very long discussion about why they abstain, but it shows you, in any event, that there is no monolit uh, monolithical kind of support for R2P in Europe. There are very important distinctions there, and it may have to do also with the particular context of the Libya resolution, where, as we know, the actual uh, implementation uh, of the resolution has seen far other things than just protecting civilians. It was about, you know, actually militarily uh, facilitating a regime change, and that was something which we're still paying the price for, uh, given the current Security Council in action with regard to Syria and so on. So the question when the Security Council will come back and refer again or operationalize R2P in the future is, I think, a very interesting for fur, uh, issue for further debate, but I'm rather um, pessimistic again on that respect. So the EU is not monolithic in its support for R2P. There is another issue here which I have to highlight, and I, I'm going to draw to a close. The EU has endorsed this, and everywhere, I'm sure, on the public forum, they will re-endorse R2P. But what is the big problem? The concept doesn't fit well EU policy tools. R2P, as you know, the international consensus on R2P, back from 2005, which was already so difficult to attain and to maintain, that international consensus is based upon this idea of what Ed Luck used to call narrow but deep notion of R2P. Narrow, constrained to these four core crimes, uh, genocide crimes against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, right? Narrow, but then deep. You have the whole apparatus from the preventative to the actual um, you know, assistance management, crisis management, post-conflict -con reconstruction, and so on. Narrow, but deep. Now, the EU, Actually, when you look at its policy tools, and uh, Jonas referred to the EU's conflict prevention uh, policies, these have been constructed years before R2P was invented as a doctrine, and they are based on a far broader notion of conflict, on a far broader notion of you know, the needs for, for uh, activating your policy tools. So this narrow but deep notion of R2P sits rather uneasily with the EU's in-place policy tools and you could then, of course, ask yourself, what should the EU do? Should it completely adjust to this narrow but deep thing that was agreed upon back in 2005 in New York by the world community, which is still going through very difficult uh, stages with regard to its operationalization and so on? Or should it rather feel free to go beyond that notion, adopt uh, its own conflict prevention instruments that are, in a way, much more no, uh, looking beyond those narrow uh, four uh, core crimes. It's a big debate of which I think we are not yet sure what the outcome will be in the European Union. I think they have not been able to resolve it properly. It's a real difficult issue. Uh, and how, how to cope with it, let me just say that the EU has to do something with it, 
There are all kinds of people urging it also to come to terms with uh, uh, its prevention of mass atrocities role. There's the recent uh, report of a task force uh, on the EU prevention of mass atrocities, which there are a couple of uh, copies available uh, to you. It's a very interesting report, uh, making interesting recommendations. In my view, useful recommendations, but not what I would say entirely up to speed with, uh, given the current institutional setup of the EU post-Lisbon. I think uh, one has to be much more uh, realistic about the complexity of the institutional setup to know, to give very precise recommendations uh, with regard to the uh, prevention of atrocities. But something needs to go on, something needs to be further prepared there. We cannot wait for initiatives of the External Action Service they actually do not have the capacity to develop real policy proposals in this respect. It can only come from a combined effort from the member states, from the commission, with all of its, say, toolkits and, and DGs regarding development cooperation, humanitarian aid, trade, and what have you, the European External Action Service, the European Parliament, and so on and so forth. So one needs to really sit together and come to a kind of a combined reflection where I think the big challenge is, yes, you have this R2P uh, uh, framework there, but it remains a flawed framework. It has paid the price of compromise at the highest international level. What is its current situation? It's in difficulties also at the global level. Um, and, and so what do you do at it as a regional organization that wants to assume a responsibility in the world? I think what we're in need of actually is some sound, fresh, out of the box conceptual thinking. Now, wh which actor could do that better, this out-of-the-box conceptual thinking, than an institute for peace? Hence, I, I'm fully in line with the uh, proposals and the ideas, and I've seen a very interesting um, policy paper by Jonas on the idea of a European Institute of Peace. I think that's maybe the way forward. We have to really bring together the resources intellectually, um, capacity, thinking of policy instruments, and so on, being realistic also about the constraints, the limitations internally and externally of EU action, but then really drawing on the best possible minds and resources to come up and shape new thinking with regard to atrocity prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wouters. Um, I think that was excellent. Both of you raised important uh, operational, conceptual, institutional challenges that we're facing in, in realizing atrocity prevention as a political priority. Uh, but fortunately, we're in D.C., where uh, everybody is uh, solution-oriented, there are no budget issues, and we can all be very optimistic, uh, so we can solve many of these challenges, I'm sure, today for you. Um, allow me to open up the floor for discussion right now, um, but as the tradition requires, I'll, uh, I'll ask one or two questions first and allow the uh, uh, panelists today to respond to each other's presentations. Um, first, I, I feel that it, it's clear from, from both of the uh, speakers here today that um, despite the many challenges, a lot of ground has been uh, gained in, in, in recent years, in, in recent decade. Uh, but some of my colleagues within, within this small community, um, they still argue that as a norm and a political uh, practice that both R2P or atrocity prevention is merely experiencing its year or even its decade of fame and that it may soon uh, recede as a priority uh, in the coming years. Uh, others, including uh, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, he mentioned clearly that R2P is here to stay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious to see from both our speakers today how they see it evolve in the next five to 10 years. Uh, will it be reconceptualized? Will it, will it stay under, in, under its curtain? Uh, under this label or, or further develop? Uh, and then perhaps the second question that I would like to toss out is that Professor Bartoli, he mentioned that genocide happens in, in closed systems. Um, and the way I always saw it uh, and, and follows very much uh, the, the rationale of, of Professor Bartoli is that there's two types of atrocity situations. Um, situations where a government is unable to protect its its uh, citizens, its population, uh, because it lacks the capacity, uh, and those where governments are unwilling to protect uh, its population, and where they often play a key role, actually, as, as the one uh, committing the violence and the atrocities. 
Now, how can the international community in such a closed system uh, play the, the most uh, beneficial role uh, because international uh, efforts are, are not welcomed? Can that only be done uh, through coercive methods or can there be uh, incentives provided? What would be the most uh, effective in this regard uh, from an international community, international actors like the US government? Any thoughts on that would be, uh, would be appreciated. Um, Andrea? Um, on the evolution of the R2P, uh, I would say that uh, it's, it's probably wise to move from uh, Kushner intervention and stand to a more prudent and uh, broad understanding of R2P that actually goes not only to the 2005 consensus, but I would argue the 1948 consensus that the state is the primary responsible entity for the protection of the citizen. This is a consensus today. This is not R2P. This is what states should be. There is an aberration that happens when states actually change, when they are not what they are supposed to be. And I think that that, that fundamental understanding is key. And I think that uh, <coughs> uh, you will never solve a, a problem of an aberration with military intervention, forcefully doing what? You know, there, there, there is no, it, it's, 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 a, it's a wrong conception of protection. It's, a, it's a, in my estimation, the wrong understanding of, of r to be, and I think it's a dangerous one, because that's been perceived in many ways as an interventionist stand that is problematic and, and dangerous. What can you do on closed systems, un unable or unwilling, this distinction that you're making? I think that uh, if you look at what happened in Kenya, I think it's, 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 a, it's an extraordinary case of system that could go in both directions. No system is uh, a given. Every system is constantly interacting on what is around. And therefore, you have systems that move in the direction of closing and rigidity and, and systems that move away from it. So when you have a situation in which you could have a potential genocide, one, you learn from possible experiences before, or one that was definitely in the mindset of many. You do speak with the institutions that are keeping the states from falling into the possibility of becoming a genocidal one by using the army, using the forces of the states that do represent the capacity for the states to stay away from those, uh, those conditions. And I think that uh, we, I believe, underestimate the capacity of the current system of interactivity because it's, it's a much more intertwined than many people realize. Yes, you, we have examples of states that keep, maintain extraordinary level of um, separation and closeness, but generally speaking, the world is moving um, in an extraordinary way into this much more open, much more interactive system. Um, I would st stop here. On the I'm going to be very uh, outspoken, uh, actually also to trigger a bit further discussion, but in my view, R2P is not here to stay. It's a fashion. It was a fashion. And with fashions, what has happening is that fashions, you know, things become uh, bypassed by new trends in fashion. And maybe R2P will come back to us in a kind of retro, nostalgic mood, like we are still, you know, like in uh, the songs of the Beatles from the 1960s and so on. It may come back to us, maybe it may come back to us also because we will not be able to find that many generally acceptable alternatives. But I think, I mean, it would be interesting to look at it as, a ba a, a, as I say, a kind of intellectual uh, effort once upon a time, and now in the previous decade, to come to terms with the legacy of the past. And of course, the very first triggering uh, thing about the debate on R2P and humanitarian intervention were partly the, the disasters of the 1990s, the Rwanda uh, uh, atrocities, the, uh, the Kosovo uh, intervention, and uh, the big uh, question that Kofi Annan uh, brought to the General Assembly in September 1999, the so-called two concepts of sovereignty, the clash between the traditional state sovereignty and the sovereignty of the individual, human rights, the, if you call the newer paradigms of international law as opposed to the old Westphalian uh, sovereign state uh, thinking. But I mean, there was a honest 
uh, sincere attempt to come up with a new doctrine, an alternative to humanitarian interventionism uh, by this ISIS uh, report and then by the, uh, say, the United Nations. But I think like uh, always in the United Nations and international uh, relations, you have to start thinking afresh and, 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 and uh, again. And so part of the uh, intellectual history of the United Nations has always been to look for new ideas that can be, as the Germans say, consensus-fake. You are in the possibility to reach a consensus, to mobilize uh, the international community, to rally it and to you know, further develop it. But I think it has some serious flaws that were never really properly addressed. And therefore, in my view, it's not there to stay. And not like, for instance, the concept of sustainable development, so one which I think has been a far better conceived concept once upon a time than R2P. So I think we are in need of some fresh thinking. But sustainable development is not a norm, so it, it, it is definitely a concept. It's just. Uh, I have a question for him. Please go ahead. So <clears throat> you mentioned history, and you mentioned the, 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 the importance of taking that into account. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on what happened in the Netherlands and in the, in the Dutch society in looking at Srebrenica and the capacity for society to look into it. In actual case, you have Dutch soldiers, you have something that happens, and you cannot ignore it anymore. Uh, next year is going to be 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. You can argue similar things on Belgium. The Belgian soldiers were there. Something happened. You cannot ignore it. So I'm curious to see what of the European democratic tradition can be brought to bear in understanding responsibilities in a new way. That is not just the responsibility of somebody when the crisis is occurring, but the responsibility of society to understand from the learning of the actual occurrences in such a way that I will not repeat the same mistake or I will make sure that I will do better or what are the things that I can do to make it different next time. It's a great topic for a next conference, I must say. Uh, now, by which, I mean, look, um, I'm, I'm a great admirer of the Dutch. Why? Because they, um, they are indeed, when s such thing happens, like what happened in 1995 with Dutch bats and the whole tragedy of Srebrenica, they at least put together a commission, uh, an independent um, kind of report is being issued. And in this case, it had really political consequences. Yeah, the, 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 the past government basically collapsed because of the critical tone of um, the Srebrenica uh, report. I think, I think yes, um, you need such thing in a society. Uh, you need to, to have uh, to develop the capacity of, uh, if such tragedy occurs, to, to, to really have a very deep reflection, independent from government, uh, on what did we do wrong, what should we have done how should we have behaved, and so on and so forth. In fact, there has been this collective report, but there are still lots of post srebrenica cases before the national courts in the Netherlands. Eh? The mothers of Srebrenica and other relatives, I mean, they have brought, really brought a lot of uh, domestic cases trying to basically sue the Netherlands, and not just the Netherlands, also the United Nations, uh, before Dutch courts in order to hold them accountable for what went wrong, because you remember, it was a so-called safe haven. And as uh, Holbrook wrote in his book on um, to end a war, it was anything but safe, those safe havens. So I mean, there too was not just a matter of national responsibility, what the Belgians did in Rwanda or the Dutch uh, as Dutch bat in uh, Srebrenica. There was also the much more wider question of, well, what was the role of the United Nations? What was the role of the Security Council, the permanent members there, and what have you? So these are very complex uh, issues on which a very wide reflection is due. What we need to do is think always have the courage to indeed look back, be really, you know, very, I think, uh, you know, scrupulous uh, and self-critical in what did we do wrong, how can we learn from this, how can we indeed not repeat the errors of the past. But, you know, there are not many countries with the ability and the courage of doing that. So, I mean, it's something that we really have to look for some best practices, but there are not that many best practices. Thank you. Um, please, there's two um, of my colleagues on the side of the room. Uh, if there are questions, then please raise your hands. I uh, see one. I'll take two questions at the time, uh, one over here on the right, and then Professor Detke afterwards. Thank you very much. Well, I'm the Department of State. 
were talking about the distinctions between the EU conflict prevention tools and what is needed for RTP tools. I will take a second question here, uh, second roll. Ian? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dieter Detke, uh, uh, Georgetown University. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for putting up this program in that context. Transatlantic relations are very important. Um, but um, what I wanted to raise here in a practical matter is um, whether uh, you know we can get a better sense of um, where the responsibility to protect ends. And I think we have a pretty good sense of that after Rwanda, after Congo, after the Balkans, um, and Kosovo. Um, so. And, and even Libya, there was a clear case of, you know, we have to act, right? The problem is more where does the responsibility to protect end? Because we can't conceive this principle as an open-ended case for intervention, right? That shouldn't be confused. So can you help us a little bit with that issue? Where does it end? Because what we have seen in Libya, and don't get me wrong, I'm not supporting the German case. I was the harshest critic of the German position. But there's one issue, and that is, in Libya, the responsibility to protect, and I support it, ended up with regime change, right? Now, if that is the main pattern, then there is a problem. And apply now the responsibility to protect in the case of Syria. Because, you know, we have a pretty good sense where it begins. 70,000 people killed, more than 100 million refugees into, you know, fragile countries like Lebanon and, and Jordan. You know, you have a massive problem. So, you know, does the responsibility to protect begin there? And then consider the question, where does it end? Can you help us with that issue a little bit? Thank you. <coughs> Um, Dr. Walters, I'll uh, pass the floor to you first now. These are, of course, very interesting and broad questions. Let me go first to the EU conflict prevention tools. I can refer you to a very interesting policy document that uh, two years ago was adopted by uh, the Council of Ministers of the EU. Uh, it's basically um, conclusions on conflict prevention. And it's a bit of an update post-Lisbon of what the EU has been doing and an effort also to, if you wish, connect conflict prevention tools of the EU to uh, R2P. And I think what is made clear in that um, policy document is that um, the EU is trying to come to a comprehensive uh, approach, comprehensive approach to preventing conflicts uh, by, by better integrating its classical conflict prevention tools and what it calls a number of key cross-cutting issues such as human rights, gender, protection of civilians, children and armed conflicts, um, and R2P, and to link that to what it can do in all areas of its so-called short and long-term um, external action. Now this is a quote from those council conclusions, and you will, uh, the connoisseurs will immediately recognize the typical EU speak, and you have all these things there that are a discourse for the EU that, that point to its, to its instruments, but the big challenge, uh, and where we have not yet been able to, to really uh, come to, to further, I think, concrete steps, is to link all these things and really um, you know, make an integrated application of them. The problem is, in the EU setup, this is very difficult because some of those policy tools are really within the Commission, and by saying within the Commission, I mean it is the so-called uh, communautaire, uh, uh, supranational approach, a lot of autonomy for EU institutions, but some of the other policy tools are in a very intergovernmental sphere. Uh, everything that falls within this common foreign and security and defense policy is very, in, very much in an intergovernmental sphere where you have to cope basically with 28 member states that have to operate on a unanimous basis. Can you imagine this? So I mean, that this is something, this shows you where the limits are of our integration process, what the EU can do and what the EU cannot do. And I'm afraid that that will not change in the very, uh, very short term. With regard to um, the Syria question, and this has become so rotten. I mean, this has, this has, uh, this has been going on for such a long time. 
that I really think we, we, we should not analyze the problem anymore in terms of R2P. It all failed. I mean, we were not able to prevent anything. We were not able to assist, to take uh, crisis management actions. I mean, where, what can we still say with regard to R2P? We failed. Everybody failed. We failed at the global level, Security Council. Um, we failed at the regional level. EU hasn't been doing anything except, of course, every council meeting uh, adopting new sanctions, yeah? expanding the sanctions regime on Libya. Uh, I mean, they had 30 or more uh, uh, council meetings in which they always took new sanctions. Okay, but that's a very poor, and if you, uh, if you wish, uh, a very uh, limited way of trying to have some impact upon uh, the problem. Um, NATO. If there is one actor in the neighborhood who could make a difference in terms of, you know, um, you know doing something like it has done in the, in the Libya case, NATO could indeed be a force there, but there is absolutely no political willingness to engage NATO in this kind of adventure. The reasons for that, I must say, are never really clearly spelled out. Does it have to do with a completely different economic, uh, geopolitical, geostrategic environment of Syria as opposed to Libya and so on? Uh, possibly, but it just becomes very incredible. I mean, that, that, that you are uh, indeed engaging NATO in a Libya operation, and then now that the, the, the human toll of the Syria disaster is already at least five times as high as in the Libya case, that you're not doing anything. The Arab League, right? well, what, one of the, I think, very interesting things about the Libya case was that international action there was actually also spurred and, if you wish, facilitated by the very request that came from the local regional organization, the Arab League. We have seen Arab League uh, action with regard uh, to, uh, to, to Syria as well. Uh, but what can the Arab League do? What can the Arab League not do? And also, what is a little bit the past of the Arab League? Let's not forget, forget, forget what the Arab League was. It was not really a pro-democracy kind of uh, organization to say the least for, for many years. So I mean, yes, we face a real problem with Syria and I think there too, it's not just a matter of applying R2P. It's, a, it's now become such a more, I think, a problematic given that, uh, yeah, you don't actually know how to, s how to get out of this with any sense of honor. It's very difficult. And I must confess, I don't expect much from the conference that is being uh, heralded now uh, by, by Russia and the US. I, I don't expect much from it. I, I skipped the first question and focus on the second one. I'm not sure that I understand it fully, but in, in a way, I, I like to take the two responsibilities, you know, the state responsibility and the individual responsibility together and say that actually uh, it would be advantageous to us to position responsibility to protect into the larger frame of relational responsibility. So if I am in front of you relationally, I certainly have a responsibility to protect you if anything happened, but before that I have the responsibility to acknowledge that you are a human being, that you have your rights, that you exist, that you have your freedom, and so, so I, I have many other responsibilities before protecting you. And coming from a country where protection is actually a bad word, because it's a mafia word, and you don't want to be protected, I actually want to be free. I don't need protection. If I need protection, that means that something is very wrong in my life. I think that we should encourage people in the direction of what uh, Paul Levy described as bureaucratic resistance. Okay, this is a story. Everybody knows Wallenberg. He was stamping documents and saving Jews from the trenches. Well, but not many know that in Stockholm, his superior were actually saving a lot, many others, because they were doing what the bureaucrats can do in situations of danger. Okay, so what I'm trying to convey is that there is a larger sense of relational responsibility that is actually calling the kids in school together with the bureaucrats at the State Department or the politician in Congress or the intelligence officer. If we start collectively thinking, well, you know what, killing massively human beings is not a good thing. And we should actually put together our intelligence to intelligence in a good sense, in a, in a proper sense. Uh, we should actually come up better. We, we actually have 
This is why I was in a way optimistic, because I find that the American response is a pragmatic response. It's a, it's a simple pragmatic response. Okay, what can we do? We can do this. Let's try to do this. At least we are trying something. Is this going to work? Maybe not, but at least we are trying something and sooner or later we will fly. There is a reason why you know, we started flying in this country, not elsewhere. So this is my plea. Okay. I want to add two brief points, particularly in reference to the first question on, on the difference in the toolbox between atrocity and conflict prevention. I mean, the way I see it and the way we approach it here at USIP is that there's two main streams of understanding that on the one hand there's, there's a group of scholars who consider the toolbox to be very strongly overlapping, uh, that the best way to prevent atrocities is actually to prevent conflict from erupting in the first place. If you do X, then, then Y will, will occur. But there's also a second group, and, and I think that I, I do support their, their rationale to some extent, is that who, who like to emphasize the distinctions that are there not necessarily in the tools you apply. The tools are largely overlapping, but the context is quite different. And the utility of conflict prevention tools changes in an atrocity prevention context. Um, the context is different since there will be, a, in my opinion, more public support of it. We, we see from opinion polling and, and, and other data that the, the populace generally considers particularly in fiscally, uh, um, within fiscal constraints, war to be inevitable, but atrocities to be unacceptable. So allowing you to uh, utilize a much broader uh, array of, of, of tools that are perhaps more intrusive. And secondly, the, the, the legal framework is also quite different, of course. Uh, there are certain duties uh, countries would have within, within a situation of genocide that, that are not there when the risk of conflict is, is still latent. Um, I would like to quickly uh, mention a, a brief study uh, we did uh, last year on, on the utility of political missions, for example. Political missions is a traditional peace-building tool uh, that can be used for conflict prevention purposes, uh, mediation, um, but we assessed the utility of this tool, political missions, in an atrocity prevention context, and then the, the tool suddenly changes quite, quite drastically. You can see, for example, that, that uh, potential perpetrators of atrocities can abuse political missions, the, the, their engagement in, with political missions to buy time in order to facilitate the, their preparation of atrocities. So that's certain, I think, important distinctions that need to be kept in mind when, when assessing uh, the tools that, that you were mentioning. And secondly, um, um, I'm, I'm uh, I think, uh, following um, a quote by, by a former Prime Minister of Belgium, Guy Verhofstadt, who said that optimism is a moral duty. I think that in that regard, I, I must agree, uh, disagree perhaps with, uh, with uh, Professor Wouters in, in the assessment of uh, the application of R2P in Syria. Uh, in my opinion, it's quite important to stress that the absence of uh, using military force does not necessarily mean the failure of R2P. I think what R2P does is it's not a panacea, it's not a cure-all for all atrocities out in the world, but what it does um, push for is an automatic consideration of your options, an, an, an automatic trigger that, that may have been absent 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we were still reinventing the wheel. Right now, at least, there's more of a focus on what options are out there, how useful they are in a certain context, but in a difficult situation like Syria, uh, it does not necessarily mean that R2P uh, move the, the right answer right in front of you. Uh, I see uh, three hands uh, here in the middle row, so let's take uh, the first one and the second one, and we'll move to uh, afterwards, sir. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence Freeman from the Africa Desk at ER Magazine. I have a basic, I have much great concern about R2P and where it's going and what it's been used for. I mean, if you go back to the brief history, it starts. Uh, Tony Blair, 1999, Chicago, says, we now, we the international community, which is very amorphous and ambiguous, have the right to intervene against nations. And then he goes on later on to, to say this is an overturning of the post-Westphalian notion of the nation state in 1648, which I think is very important to have sovereignty of nation states. When you look at where this has taken us, if you look at Iraq, uh, hundreds of thousands, of not millions of people die, including many most of them and civilians and children. Libya was regime change. Uh, and whether the context was there or not, look at the results. Two countries, Mali and Nigeria, being destabilized. And 
Libya turned into virtually controlled by al-Qaeda. It's an al-Qaeda state, or rapidly becoming one. If we did the same thing in Syria, it'd be even worse, and that's why the Russians are balky, because they know it's regime change in, Russia, in Syria, and they're holding back from that. So this is, is a political policy coming out of Blair and his, uh, the geopolitical faction, and we should be very concerned. If we're looking at atrocities, look at Africa. I mean, millions of people are dying from lack of food and health. More than all have been killed in genocidal wars. We do nothing. In Europe, where you come from, the European Union, the Troika is dictating policies to Greece, Spain, Portugal, Cyprus, that it's going to increase the death rate. This has already been documented by the UN. So how do we deal with that? So I, I think RTP is flawed. I think we have to respect the nation state, and we have to find real political economic solutions to help countries not remove leaders, which I see no uh, success story so far in RTP other than failure. I think it should be removed completely, along with Obama's atrocity position. Will Ferrojaro, Internews, and uh, thank you again for the panel. Uh, my question is, um, I guess, mostly directed at Professor Wolters. Um, my, Samantha Power, I think we were trying to decide, was it in December 2010, uh, spoke at, in, in, in Paris uh, at a conference sponsored by the U.S. Holocaust Museum and the French Holocaust uh, Memorial. And uh, from my understanding of the speech, in a sense, updated the Europeans on what the U.S. was doing on atrocity prevention, in a sense, threw down the gauntlet. And so I guess my question is, we've heard today about the lack of uh, cohesion, the lack of uh, 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 concrete application of the various uh, initiatives within the European uh, community. Uh, my question is, where do things stand at a national level then? Has any of the other uh, countries taken up the role uh, institutionally within individual states, and, and so I'd appreciate your response if, if the European uh, Union uh, is less than, a, less than its whole. Let me uh, ask Jan to uh, respond to this question. Well, a couple of um, uh, points and questions, but uh, going to this, this um, particular one, um, I think it's imp indeed important to see what is happening at the national level because um, R2P has been a concept that uh, has not just been endorsed at the um, uh, European level. Uh, it has also been, uh, you know, it has been influential at least a few years ago in, in developing a number of, uh, if you wish, new, new attitudes and policies in, uh, uh, at, at nation state level. Let, let me give you a, the example of France. France, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, exercised the EU presidency in the second half of 2008. Uh, was quite influential in, in shaping the new version, if you wish, of the European security strategy. Uh, you had the so-called 2008 uh, security strategy uh, um, implementation report of Javier Solana, but that was very much, uh, let's say, um, um, negotiated and discussed during the French uh, uh, presidency. Uh, uh, I mentioned already Bernard Kouchner. What is very interesting is like, uh, prior to coming with um, this uh, uh, R2P idea to the EU and, the, and the, the whole European security strategy, the French had, doing, uh, had been doing some homework and had included explicit references to uh, R2P both in the French white paper on defense and uh, white paper on defense and national security and on, in the French white paper on foreign affairs. And so from there on they basically under, you know, remember the rather uh, <coughs> energetic drive of, of uh, uh, President uh, Sarkozy. Uh, they really also tried to then make the step to the European Union and have R2P um, to be um, uh, reinforced um, at, the, at the EU level. But they had a broad notion of R2P. French really did some interesting thinking about it. They really said we have to look at this in a comprehensive manner. We have to give more attention to protection of civilians. We have to uh, look at it also in the context of uh, judicial um, and accountability. Think of the ICC, uh, the European Union, throughout the existence of the International Criminal Court has been a staunch supporter. And I think indeed there is an important role to be played um, also in this preventative type of mode uh, by um, um, criminal law, international criminal law, the ICC, but possibly also at the national level. Yeah, that's where we now face interesting novelties at the national level with a recent, recent uh, judgment um, in Guatemala about uh, the genocide. Uh, 
the, the Libya um, trial itself with regard to uh, the son of Gaddafi and so on. So you see interesting dynamics there. And I think indeed um, there, is, there is some thinking about this at the national level in the EU as well, but not enough. Not enough and moreover dispersed. So I think we, we, we need to, to bring together the best of minds from the national and the EU level to, to, to further develop some, some, um, some thoughts with regard uh, to say, the, the problem of prevention of mass atrocities in a very wide context, very pro a comprehensive uh, approach, really making use of all instruments that are out there, and some of which have been in place for a while, but have not been sufficiently tapped from, like, for instance, uh, the, the, the mechanisms of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Andrea. Uh, I'll Apologies. Uh, I'll uh, do a quick effort to answer uh, Lawrence Freeman's question. Uh, I appreciate your comments. Um, I think certainly R2P and atrocity prevention policy has rough edges, um, but what I would recommend is, is to try to improve it rather than uh, throw it out and, uh, and start again from scratch. And for two main reasons, I think, if you look at recent history, there's been more challenges with the absence of international efforts than with um, over excessive uh, intrusiveness into national sovereignty uh, in the name of humanitarianism. And secondly, uh, we also have to understand that RTP and, and atrocity prevention is very broad uh, and, and, and not solely uh, military intervention. M much of it, economic support, uh, first of all, just included uh, trade agreements, can actually have a beneficial effect on uh, internal reform. And in many cases, the, com the countries that are at risk of conflict and atrocities, they're actually asking for supports. They are the ones that instigate and, and request capacity building assistance on this. Um, so I, I think in, in no way in, in those cases um, the international community would be uh, infringing on, on the national uh, sovereignty of those requesting states. Uh, I think that would be my, my two cents uh, in that regard. Uh, we had another question there in the back. Hi, Doug Brooks. I'm a consultant. But for 10 years I ran an association of companies that work in conflict and post-conflict environments. Um, I think the really the sort of blunt reality that we have to deal with those, if there is going to be a response to an atrocity, uh, it's going to be uh, the U.S. that will either do it or will essentially ag agree to allow it to happen. And the EU, which is, uh, for the reasons I think that our, our panelists have talked about today, have basically tied up bureaucratically to the point where they cannot respond, um, except as sort of an accessory. Um, and that leaves essentially the U.S. military capability and regional military capabilities, perhaps in Africa, to actually be able to do this sort of response. So I think it, to a certain extent it makes sense for the EU to focus on uh, atrocity prevention before it even starts, because once it starts, it's uh, really up to the United States and convincing the United States that it's worthwhile to, to, to do any sort of response. Any other questions here, top? Yeah, Todd Lindbergh from the Hoover Institution. Uh, first, uh, well, to clarify one point, uh, RTP does not represent the end of sovereign right. What it represents is the end of uh, a shield of sovereignty over the perpetration of atrocities and the assertion that others have no right to interfere uh, on, in internal affairs. Uh, and uh, if uh, I, I think we need, whether it's, whether it's, I also think that, that, that there's some risk of, of sort of valorizing the notion of RTP, and I think that uh, the Professor Wattebridge and, and Andrea, and, and the way that each teased this out a bit, uh, uh, RTP is, is an element in a, uh, a response. It, it, it is not the response. Uh, it can never be made self-actualizing. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, the question of, of political will is always going to be present in these kinds of situations. Uh, there's, there's no conceivable mechanism uh, that will achieve automaticity uh, in terms of the response of the international community uh, to situations like this. Uh, but, I, but the question that I just wanted to ask Professor Weathers uh, is, what would this meeting that you've been hinting at uh, among our other key European players uh, look like? Uh, who would be there? How could it be convened? Uh, and, um, and how can I help? Uh, Andrea, do you have a response? Go, go ahead. Well, 
I'm, I'm learning on the spot here, uh, having been, uh, as, uh, say, uh, we, we were discussing prior to this meeting about the, 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 the US initiative, this interagency uh, atrocity prevention board, which of course you cannot just take over and copy for the EU context. It's a very different context. But I think we, d we need to really learn from it uh, where, it com where it came from. Uh, what were the various say, driving factors? I, I understand it was, if you wish, like uh, various lines coming together. There was a willingness with the administration. There was uh, NGO uh, support for it. You had, of course, right academics, the work of Samantha Power and so on. I think uh, in Europe, we, we too may be, um, we may be in need of bringing those various driving factors together. Um, and, and set up a, a kind of similar uh, instrument. What is, what is going to be very important, again, is coping with diversity. Because that's one of the things we just have to learn. The EU is just a very heterogeneous club of nations. That makes for its, I think, charm. That makes for its, uh, I think, uh, legitimacy party. Because let's not forget, if you, have, if you, get, on, uh, if you get all those nations um, to adopt a common position, it must mean that they have been able to reach some kind of, you know, common ground, middle of the road approach, and so on. So it, that very often also helps the EU to to come up with statements at the international level because there is some some balancing act that you have to do, taking an, into account very diverse, um, uh, if you wish, attitudes and traditions prior to making an EU statement. So I think that yes, if you have to do it in an EU context, one has to properly think about its its setup, its composition. Um, and again, in that respect, I think the idea of an EU Institute for Peace is not a bad idea. Maybe you can invite Todd and have a similar meeting like this in Brussels and then you can start some, uh, some exploration. But I do believe that it's good to try, it's definitely good to try to see what in the context of the actual uh, conditions make sense. Yeah. Any uh, final round of questions? Uh, the back row. Yeah, in, I'm Greg Stanton. I'm from George Mason University. Uh, and I'm also president of Genocide Watch and worked in the State Department before that. Um, I just wanted to let you know, and this is in response, in fact, to the last question. Um, we are contemplating exactly what has been talked about. Uh, we're going to be having a meeting in Berlin uh, the 30th of May through the 1st of June at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy in Berlin, also sponsored by the Budapest Center uh, for the Prevention of Genocide. And um, it's going to involve a lot of um, European leaders, politicians, and so forth, uh, and also European NGOs, uh, you know, Crisis Action and Aegis Trust, groups like that. But we are really looking for American uh, leaders and NGOs to come to this very meeting. Uh, and so if any of you are interested in this meeting, uh, I'd be delighted to uh, you know, help you come to the meeting. It's not a funded meeting. That is, they haven't got a lot of money at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. But if your organization would be willing to send you we would be delighted to have you come. Because I think that Andrea is right, that the American experience with this, and that's what they want to hear at this meeting. They want to hear what the American experience has been and uh, decide how Europe and the United States can cooperate in this common effort uh, against atrocities. So um, please, See me afterwards if you're interested. Any final question? Otherwise, I will I ask. I have a comment. On this. Oh, please go ahead. Just, just to say that uh, this is another example of uh, of this this vitality of the moment. Um, you know, we had we had for a long time uh, young people volunteering to go to war. You know, war was the motivating moment in which people would prove their masculinity and, and defend their countries and so on. You have a lot of people now volunteering to do humanitarian work, prevention work, anti-violence work, 
well, that, that's interesting. You know, it's, it's an interesting responsibility. Berlin is organized by young people, mostly. I mean, Greg is, is always in good company of uh, young people. And uh, the Budapest Center is a very interesting construction. It's, it's, a, it's a new way to try to respond in a certain way. Uh, Wellspring is organizing the meeting with Bridgeway and Humanity United in Istanbul, similar uh, time. But there is a, what, what I'm trying to convey is that there is a milieu, there is a, there is a, a vitality of work around this that I think could be and should be in a way uh, uh, supported, that is part of the conversation. And it's not only a statist, you know, centered idea that, that you know, the state is over there and the, and the society is in a different place, but rather that there is this osmotic relationship that is actually the precondition for the prevention to actually be conceptualized correctly. I would like to uh, thank both speakers at this point, as well as the participants, for their uh, very excellent questions. Uh, special thanks to um, Moral Nori and uh, Ian Proctor for uh, pulling this all together, as well as anybody else. Uh, who I may be forgetting at this point. Uh, I think there's plenty of ground to be covered here. Uh, so we look forward to hosting you all for future events on our prevention related work. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to uh, wish you all an enjoyable day. Thank you. Thank you.